here is we're studying uh, a system of signs, signs being that relationship, um, some somehow signaled a relationship between uh, something, a meaning of unit or a, a thing we're talking about, and the signal that uh, expresses that sign. And the signal that expresses that sign, I tried to convince you, has to do with what goes on in our heads when we speak. Okay? And there's sort of like two ways of thinking about what's going on there, depending on which physical attribute you focus on. On the one hand, there's a series of gestures that go on, a series of movements in the body that go on to make, make these sounds, make these signs. And on the other hand, there's the actual product of that suite of movements, the bodily gestures, the sounds in the air themselves, the things that your ears use to decode what's going on. It's perhaps easiest, I think, somehow, to think about what signs consist in, of, in, of, uh, as those gestures that make sounds. And so that's how I'll speak from now on. What we're studying are the things that go on in our face and in our lungs to make words, the signs that carry information. It's a little easier to think that way because that way of thinking um, also sort of has a more universal application as there are languages that have no sounds associated with them, namely signed languages. And yet signed languages, just like the languages that, I, that you and I use when we speak, involve gestures. Okay? So our thought is that what we are studying when we study signs are gestures, movements that go on, in the case of speech, that go on in the face and in the chest. The result are sounds that your ears use. Okay? That's where we'll start today. We will look at, we will look at what goes on in our bodies to create speech sounds, the sounds that make up signs. And that branch of, uh, of linguistic science is called articulatory phonetics. Articulatory phonetics is one of two big branches in phonetics, the study of, of speech sounds. The other branch being acoustic phonetics, which studies not the gestures, but the sounds produced thereby. And we will take a brief look at acoustic phonetics as well. But today we start looking at what goes on in the anatomy to make speech sounds, the sounds that line up to make words. Part of that involves knowing something about, well, those regions of the body that uh, play a role. And so we'll start by cutting up the head. Yeah? I have actually wonderful slides, beautiful color photographs of actual heads sliced up in different configurations. But in past years, I found that makes students drop when I show them. And so today, I will uh, simply show you pictures. Okay? Here's a head sawed in half. Uh, here's a nose just in case you're lost. This big thing is a tongue. Looks a lot better when it's in the mouth. Uh, and this here is called a larynx. Your voice box. Okay, this thing. Mm -hmm. And this is another sketch of the larynx. This is the front of the face. This is a, uh, the thyroid a cartilage. It's this big bone that sticks out into your throat. Uh, and if we were to look down inside here, I'll take a picture. Here's the, here's the larynx again, the front, the back, a side view. If you were to look down through your mouth, you could look into the windpipe that goes through the larynx here, and you'd see that. Yeah, you can imagine <laughs> what those photos look like. Uh, this is the front, this is the back, this is just a mess of flesh. These things are called the vocal cords. Okay. And they close uh, by virtue of little triangular pins that are under the skin here. Uh, they swing like this, and the vocal folds close as a result. It's a good thing we have this, because this is the windpipe. And when we're eating, we want to close this off uh, lest we die from choking. And uh, that's one of the functions of the vocal folds. Okay. 
The other function is to make noise. Uh, yes, sir. Was that the original function of the vocal folds? Was that the original function? Yes. Probably, we surmise. Um, the larynx is, uh, you know, if you look at our larynx and compare it to other primates, there's huge differences in them, which suggest evolutionary pressures from the result of speech. Um, and it's by that, uh, by, the, by, by that measure that we have some idea of when language uh, evolved in our species. Okay. Uh, so this makes, this is one of the sources of noise that we use to manipulate speech sounds. Um, and there's two ways in which the vocal, app, the larynx can be used to make noise. One is to leave the vocal folds open like this, blow air through it, and you get as a result. Mm -hmm. The other way is to swing the vocal folds closed, which is done by virtue of those pins, and tightening a little bit, and then to blow air through, in which case the vocal folds start flapping like this as air is forced through them, and what you get is ah. We call the first kind of sound, a sound produced in the first, with the first open glottis, which is the name of this space here between the vocal folds, we call that kind of sound voiceless. And we, ca we call the kind of sound that involves vibrating the vocal folds by closing the glottis, closing the vocal folds together, voiced. Okay. The speed at which the vocal folds flap is what your ears perceive as pitch. So the faster they flap, the higher in pitch. Ah, uh, just to give you an idea of pitch. Mm -hmm. The way the vocal folds are made to flap faster is by ratcheting the tension up on the closure. And one way that's done is physically is this way. So this whole larynx sits like this on your throat and is attached at the back by two pins. And the whole thing, whole thing, whole thing can swing up and down like this. The vocal folds are attached to the larynx in the front but to the spine in the back. And as the larynx swings up, more tension is created by pulling on the vocal folds as a function of, a, as a function of the distance that it swings. Okay. And so one way pitch is raised is by swinging the larynx up, increasing the tension on the closure. So put your hand on your throat, or your neighbors, gently, <laughs> and do this. Ah! Ah! Oh, you are such a satisfying audience. <laughs> Did you feel your throat swing forward? Absolutely. No. <laughs> ah! This is easier to feel if you are male. Because a ter one of the many terrible things that happens to men in puberty is that the larynx grows in length, um, causing you know, this region to be longer, making it a little harder to get this thing to vibrate fast. Which was why uh, men, on average, have slightly lower pitched voices than women. Okay. So if ever you're in doubt of, as to the gender of your date, stare at their throat carefully. <laughs> right, so. right. Okay. And now let's look at the, so that's how, that's how noise is created at the throat. We blow air through the glottis, the opening in the, in the vocal folds, and it either vibrates or it doesn't vibrate. And this, you know, it vibrates like this or it just vibrates like this. And this vibrating air passes up into the head, into the oral tract, and into the nose. All of the differences, mm. pretty much all of the differences in speech sounds, come about by making the configuration of the head different. Uh, and so what I'm going to do is teach you these differences in speech sounds based you know, by teaching you how the face is configured to make that sound. And to do that, I need to teach you some names of the face. This, ladies and gentlemen, is called a nose. <laughs> These are called teeth. The thing that comes outside of them and gets bloodied when the teeth are bashed against something are called lips. Mm-hmm. 
Uh, what else do you need to know? <laughs> uh, if you take your thumb and put your, open your mouth and put your thumb right behind your upper teeth and then push the thumb back ever so slightly along the roof of your mouth, some of you are not doing this, I notice. <laughs> you will feel up there a kind of ridge. Can you feel a ridge? Yeah. Right after which there's a big dome. Can you feel that? Yeah. Great. The ridge is called alveolar, the alveolar ridge. Right there, roughly. Okay, can you see that? And right behind the alveolar ridge, the roof of the mouth domes up into what's called the hard palate. Okay. Alveolar ridge, hard palate. Please restore your thumb. And now push your thumb as far back along the roof of your mouth as it will go. Until it gets. Ma'am, I notice that you're just twirling your hair. I, I can't help but notice that. Would you please put your, let me see your fingernails. Oh, I see the reason. <laughs> if you put your thumb far enough back, you'll notice it gets mushy. And if, you were, if your thumb were longer, uh, it would get mushier and mushier until it becomes movable. <laughs> Was that ooh? <laughs> I mean, parts of your mouth move, ladies and gentlemen. It's just a fact. That bit is called the velum. Here it is. Okay, This thing can move. It moves up and down, and when it moves back or up, what it does is it closes off the nasal cavity. Mm -hmm. So, like for instance, when you're eating, usually the velum is raised so that food passes safely down into your stomach. Uh, when it's not raised and you snort, it's then that the milk and Wheaties come up into your nose. Okay, that's the passage right back here. All right, the velum. Okay, those are the things you'll need to know. Alveolar ridge, hard palate, velum. Teeth, lips, tongue. Got it? Sir? In terms of knowing it, uh, uh, should we know how to be able to label it? Mm hmm. So, when I come to you in the midterm and I open my mouth in front of you and point, you should be able to say, yeah, dude, that's an alveolar ridge. Yeah. Okay. Great. All right. So, there are some reference points. And now we'll start. What I'll do is, um, I'll, as I said, I'll describe the different uh, ways in which speech sounds are articulated. And when I do that, I will introduce the symbol from the alphabet designed by linguists to represent that particular gesture, that speech sound. That alphabet is called the International Phonetic Alphabet and it was designed by a group of language teachers in France who uh, were you know, faced with the task of trying to describe to their pupils oh, what that sound is in German that they're trying to teach them or what that sound is in English that they're trying to teach them that French doesn't have, say. So what they did is they designed an alphabet that represents the sounds that they perceived in the languages that they were responsible for teaching. And that alphabet borrows very heavily from a pioneer in a foreign language pedagogy named Henry Sweet. He was a, a genius, a linguistic genius, but one of the world's worst students. He barely passed college because he couldn't do anything except linguistics. Uh, in addition to that, he was an extremely unpleasant fellow. He never really got a job. It's him that Henry Higgins from My Fair Lady is fashioned after, this gentleman right here. One of our heroes in linguistics, a castaway like the rest of us. <laughs> Here are some of the principles that steered the IPA designers, the International Phonetic Alphabet originators. First, every single glyph, every single graph in the alphabet should 
be mapped on faithfully to the very same single sound. So no ambiguity here. Two, the symbols used should be familiar to them. And for this reason, they borrowed from the orthography, the alphabet, the Roman, you know, the Roman alphabet, the very same symbols that are used to spell things. And that, is no, that leads to no end of confusion. Not at all. So the first two bullets are just, every symbol should have a unique meaning. It should always represent exactly one sound. And the third bullet is, let's borrow. Let's borrow symbols from the, from the spelling system of our languages. Uh, and you'll see that the alphabet I'll teach you has many of the very same symbols that the alphabet you use to spell words with does. That's why they were lazy. Mm -hmm. Okay. But it's important that we understand when we use a symbol that's found both in the spelling system and in the International Phonetic Alphabet that we know which of these meanings it has. And so whenever you are using the International Phonetic Alphabet, you should enclose those symbols, those letters, in square brackets. Okay? So that will be our signal that these letters are from the International Phonetic Alphabet. They mean what that alphabet means. Each one of these letters will correspond to a single unique sound. Single unique sounds are called phones. So there's a one-to-one -one mapping between the letters of the alphabet and phones. And what you, will, uh, you know, what you will need to do in this class is learn how to represent with this alphabet what you hear. Doing that is called transcribing something. It's hard. It's really, really hard. You have a week to do it, uh, to learn how to do it, okay? Um, good luck. Mm. Shall we start? I'll start by uh, dividing the sounds that we'll learn into two great classes. One class involves what are called consonants. These are all sounds that involve some sort of articulation in the head that almost closes the oral tract. So there will be a great big restriction somewhere in the mouth for all of these sounds, consonants. And the second group of sounds we'll learn are vowels. Those are sounds that are made by not making a very big restriction somewhere in the, in the mouth, but instead by making a sort of shape out of the oral tract. Okay. Today we'll start with consonants. And I'll describe each of these consonants as I give you their their symbol from the IPA, and in my description, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you three things, or four things. I'll tell you how great that restriction in the oral cavity is. That, that way of describing sounds involves a property that we call manner of articulation. Uh, this will become clear when we start looking at them, actually. So I'll tell you how big the restriction in the oral cavity is. I'll tell you where that restriction is. So what, you know, what parts of your mouth are used in making this, narrowing this closure uh, in, the, in the oral tract. I'll tell you whether or not vibrating air goes into the nose. Those sounds in which air does go into the nose are called nasal, and those which don't are non-nasal. And finally, I'll tell you whether or not the vibrating, or the vocal cords are vibrating, whether they are voiced or voiceless. Okay? These slides will be on the web page. Yeah. Okay. So the first class of sounds we'll look at are ones in which a complete closure is made somewhere in the oral tract. Sounds in which a complete closure is made in the mouth are called stops. We will look at stops. The first stop we'll look at involves a closure that's made by bringing the two lips together. These are called bilabial stops, bi meaning two, labial meaning lips, involving the two lips. The first of these 
is the sound you find in the word spam, the IPA symbol that's used to transcribe it is the same symbol that we often use to spell it, a lowercase p. It's bilabial, it's voiceless, and air does not go into the nose. Okay? Now, not only are you going to be able, you're going to have to learn what these symbols mean, um, and you're going to have to train your ear to know when you're hearing these different sounds, but you're also going to have to learn how each, remember how each of these sounds is made. And you know, it's hard. It's just a lot to memorize. And so um, there's a few little clues I can give you that will help you determine if you've forgotten whether a sound you're making is voiced or voiceless, whether a sound you're making is nasal or non-nasal. Okay? So um, um, here's how you can do that. Uh, first, let me tell you, we'll see this soon. The sound s is voiceless. The sound z is voiced. Okay? You can tell the difference between voiceless and voiced sounds by gripping firmly the top of your head and saying the sound. S and z. Do you feel your head vibrate? Voiced sound. Mm -hmm. Technique two. Plug your ears with your index fingers, please. Make sure they are carefully sealed. And now make the first sound. And now make the second sound. Do you hear the difference? You will always be able to tell a voice from a voiceless sound. Also, you can grip your throat, but that sometimes leads to choking. Okay. Nasal versus non-nasal sounds. Grab your nose and make the sound mm. and now make the sound the first sound your nose vibrates, the second it doesn't. If there's air in your nose and it's because of a speech sound, your nose will be vibrating. That's how you know it's nasal. Okay? So Non-nasal, voiceless. Right? Second sound. Also a bilabial stop. Also non-nasal, but this one is voiced. B. Can you feel the difference? B. P. Third sound. Also a bilabial stop. This one's voiced, but this one's nasal. It is. So far, so good? Okay. The next stops we'll look at are ones that are made by making a closure in the mouth with the tongue at the alveolar ridge. So here's what happens. The tongue raises, the tip of the tongue touches the alveolar ridge, and the sides of the tongue cup up around the hard palate. The first of these sounds is the sound you find in the word stand. It's voiceless, it's non-nasal, it's the sound ta. Yes, do try making it. Ta. Can you feel the tip of your tongue touching the alveolar ridge? Ta. Okay. The second of these sounds is exactly the same. It's an alveolar stop, it's non-nasal, but this one is voiced. It is da. Da, ta. Okay. And the third of these is exactly like da. It's voiced, it's alveolar, but it's nasal too. It is na. Na. Can you feel that? All about getting in touch with your mouth, ladies and gentlemen. Okay? Sir. Is there such a thing as a voiceless um, nasal sound? Is there such a thing as a voiceless nasal sound? There is such a thing, um, but we won't see one in English. Okay? 
The next set of stops are made by producing a closure with the back of the tongue against the back of the roof of the mouth, actually against the velum. And so these are called velar stops. These are all vaguely gagging sounds, the first of which is the sound ka, voiceless, non-nasal, ka. The back of the tongue makes a closure at the velum. Ka. And the transcription symbol is a lowercase k. The second of these sounds is just like the first, except it's voiced. It is ga. Ga. Okay. Voiced, non nasal. And the symbol from the IPA is a lowercase g, just like the symbol we use to spell this sound often. Okay. And the last of these sounds is nga. Nga. Very good. It's just like ga, except it's nasal. Nga. Nga. This sound is usually found at the ends of words or syllables, like in sing. Okay? It's voiced, it's a velar stop, it's nasal. There is no letter for this in our orthography, and so finally we sit, we find an IPA symbol that isn't copied from the Roman alphabet. It's an N with a little hook on it. It's called an angma. That's its name. Mm -hmm. Bye. <laughs> and there's one last stop. It's very, very common in English, but it's very, very hard. F it's something you're not aware you do, uh, like many other things probably. Okay. It is the stop that's found at the beginning of many vowels that are spelled as if they have a vowel at the beginning. Okay. So like for instance, in the word uh-oh, both parts of that word, the uh and the o, oh, actually start with a consonant, with a stop. Can you hear that? Uh. Or there are certain dialects of English that say, for instance, the word that I pronounce as bottle, or bottle, as bottle. In the middle of that word, there is one of these stops. This is a stop that's produced at the vocal folds by closing the vocal cords at the glottis and then opening them. It's called a glottal stop. Okay. And the way it's transcribed is with a question mark without a dot. Okay, a glottal stop. Okay. Those are the stops that we will see in this class. So far so good? We okay? The next set of sounds that we'll look at are sounds that are made by bringing something in your mouth close to something else in your mouth. And as they, these two things get close to each other, the narrowing gap causes the air that's being blown through to start being turbulent at that point. Those sounds all, that, that physical action, we hear as a kind of hissing sound. And so these are all sounds that are sort of hissing sounds. They are called fricatives. The first two we'll look at don't show up in English, but we'll see them soon enough. They're created by bringing the two lips very close together. The first sounds like this. And it's how Japanese pronounce the first sound of the name of this uh, m famous mountain, Fuji. We use a different sound here, but in Japanese it's Fuji. Okay, Fuji. It's voiceless, it's non-nasal, it's bilabial, and it's a fricative. And the second of these sounds is just like the first, but it's voiced. If you're a Spanish speaker, it's the way you probably pronounce the sound that comes in the middle of this, this word. De ver, 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 ver. 
It's just like fa, but it's voiced. V, fa. Okay. These are the transcription symbols, both from the Greek alphabet. This is a, is that a phi, a phi, a pho, a phi? And this is a lowercase beta. Not in English, ma'am. The first is not like the first is not is not like the sound at the beginning of food. We don't have it in English. Okay, we don't say either of these sounds when we say English words, unless you're a Japanese or a Spanish speaker and are using your native sounds, sir. Um, so the difference between a fricative and a stop is that. Uh, That's right. So the difference, for instance, between this fricative fa and the stop made at the same place, pa, is only that in pa the lips come together and in fa they just get close to each other. That in principle is the difference between stops and fricatives, whether they, the two things come all the way together or only very close together. The next two we'll learn are in English. They are the sounds th and v. They're produced by taking the lower lip and making it go towards the upper ridge of teeth. Fa and va. They're both non-nasal. The first is voiceless, the second voiced. And the IPA symbols used to transcribe those sounds are the same ones that are frequently used in our spelling system to spell them. Labiodental lip teeth. Fix vex. Okay. The next two we'll look at are produced by taking the tip of the tongue and getting it close to the same ridge of teeth, front upper teeth. They are the sounds as in thigh and th as in thigh. They're both non nasal. The first is voiceless, the second voiced. Th and the. And the symbols we use to transcribe those sounds are a lowercase theta and this thing which is called a thorn that comes from the runic alphabet. It looks like a backward six that's wearing a hat. <laughs> th and the. The next two fricatives are created by bringing the tip of the tongue up to the alveolar ridge. And there's actually different ways of pronouncing this across speakers. I sort of lay my tongue up against the alveolar ridge because I'm an old hippie. These are the sounds sa and za. Sa and za. Okay. They're both non-nasal. One's voiceless, sa. And the other's voiced. Z. Go ahead, say them. S and z. Can you? Yeah. And the symbols we use to transcribe those sounds are the same ones that are frequently used to spell it a lowercase s, a lowercase z. The next two fricatives, gosh, there's a heck of a lot of fricatives, are produced by taking again the tip of the tongue and bringing it not up to the alveolar ridge, but pointing it right behind the alveolar ridge, right where the alveolar ridge curves up to make the hard palate. Okay. So the point of articulation is somewhere between the alveolar ridge and the hard palate. So sometimes these are called alveopalatals. Or sometimes they're just called post-alveolar, right behind the alveolar ridge. I can never remember which term I use, and so I use them both freely. Okay. Post-alveolar here. These are the sounds sh and z. Neither of them are nasal. One is voiced, z. The other voiceless, sh. And they're transcribed with an S that's been on a rack. Mm -hmm. And 
again, something from the runic alphabet, um, it looks like a fetus. <laughs> Hi. And the star of our lecture today <laughs> okay, post alveolar or alveopalatal fricatives. Okay, and the last two fricatives we'll look at again do not show up in English, but we'll see them soon enough. These are both non nasal, like all the other fricatives we've seen. There's a voiced and a voiceless pair. They're found in the Germanic languages like German and Dutch, um, and French too, uh, not a German, also other languages like French. Um, the first is the sound that's found if you're German in pronouncing this one of, you know, this, what, 1300 Bachs, one of these composers. It's the sound or something like that. Okay. No, I, that's completely wrong. No, that's completely right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And the other is just doing that, but voicing it. Um, I don't actually know how to make these sounds. Is there a Dutch speaker in the house? <laughs> Something like that, okay? <laughs> you know, it's that sexy noise that... <laughs> Just gets you nowhere. <laughs> yeah. And the transcription symbols are a lowercase x and, you know, like a, a cancer ribbon. Okay, a, kind of a thing. Okay. Yeah. I don't know if there's anybody who can take Arabic in here who could confirm this, but I think that those two are also the hard H and the G in Arabic. I think it's also the ha and the. I can't pronounce it. Yeah. Actually, I think those are, I think they're different fricatives in Arabic. Yeah, they're a little bit farther back than these two. I think. Yeah. So, but they sound very similar. Okay. There's one last fricative. Um, it's found in English. It's produced by just tightening up the back of your throat and blowing air through it. It's the sound <sighs> Okay, It's voiceless, it's non-nasal. Um, I'm going to call it a glottal fricative. And the transcription symbol is a lowercase at h. The same thing that's often used to spell it. Sorry. Did, um, did you have to skip the fricatives? I did. You will see signs that are on your handout that I'm not going to teach you. They're there just in case we run into them later on. Okay? Okay? Those are the fricatives. Now, as I said, one thing you're going to have to do is remember how all of these sounds are made, and that's going to involve remembering, well, you know, whether they're nasal or not, or whether they're voiced or not. I seem to get my vocal cords in my nose mixed up today. And you can do that by just grabbing your head and making the sound and looking for a buzz. Okay? Um, but the other thing you'll have to remember is, like, where in the mouth are these sounds made? And that's a bit harder to perceive. Uh, I think with stops you can perceive it by just paying attention, you know, you've got nerves in your mouth, just paying attention to the nerves in your mouth. Like, you know when your lips are touching each other, so you'll know when something's bilabial. You can figure out where the tip of your tongue is. It's hugely sensitive, and so you'll know whether the tip of the tongue is at the alveolar ridge or at the teeth and so on. Mm -hmm. If you have trouble with that, just jar your chin while you're making it. Okay. But fricatives, no two things touch each other, and so it's a lot harder to perceive. Okay. So here's a trick. If you make the fricative sound, but rather than blowing the warm air out of your lungs, you suck the cold air into your lungs, you will feel the saliva evaporate where these two things come close together. That will feel like a cooling sensation in your mouth. Okay? So that's a way of kind of figuring out where the point of articulation is for fricatives, should you forget. 
So try it. Make s and now suck. Can you feel? There's coolness on your tongue and the roof of your mouth. Roughly speaking, where those two things come together. Can you feel that? Uh, try and now suck. Can you feel? You'll feel the tip of your tongue is cooling in a different way. I mean, it's pointing up. You'll feel the air coming over the top of it. Okay. So if you happen to forget where your fricatives are made and you're in a desperate situation, my advice is suck. Okay. Mm -hmm. The next set of sounds we're going to learn are sounds that combine a stop with a fricative. These are called affricates. So these are sounds that, whose articulation involves a complete closure somewhere, a stop, and then after releasing the closure, rather than just opening up the closure like a stop goes, the two articulators part slightly to make a fricative. Okay? Affricates. A stop fricative pair all in one articulation. Yeah, that's one. So one is made by bringing the tip of the tongue to the alveolar ridge or right behind it, making a stop like a ta or a da, and then releasing it to a fricative like a sha or a ja. Okay? So these are the sounds cha and ja. Cha, ja. Cha, ja. And the IPA symbols for them are the symbols for the stop thing, ta and da, and the symbols for the fricative part, stretched s and fetus, squash together into one sound. Okay. Cha, ja, affricates. Okay? Am I right so far? I don't actually know this thing. Yes? When I say those, I put it on the alveolar ridge. You do? Time. Okay. Does that mean I speak wrong? Yeah, you probably, I, I could tell right away that you spoke wrong. Um, but make those sounds for me. I think, I mean, I'd, I'd have to actually look. But, I, like, make those sounds. Ch and j. Now, your tongue moves, right, when you make those. Ch and j. Does it move back? Does it move straight down? Ch. Ja. I think the difference is just whether you're a back mover or a not back mover. So probably those of you where the tongue is not moving back, put the tongue behind the alveolar ridge and then release it a little bit to a sha sound. Whereas those of you, like you, I suspect, put their tongue at the alveolar ridge to make a ta and then move the tongue back a little bit and release it to make a sha. That's what I think I do. You do? <laughs> I mean, when you make those sounds, or just in general? Just behind my teeth. Yeah. Not like, like right on the alveo. Really? Cha, ja. Cha, ja. Cha, ja. Cha, ja. Cha, ja. I put it like right behind my teeth. You might. Cha, ja. Yeah. Cha, ja. Cha, ja. Cha, ja. Cha, ja. Try that, ladies and gentlemen. Put your tongue right behind your teeth and make the trust. Cha, ja. Cha, ja. Cha, ja. You're a freak. What can I say? Yeah. <laughs> yes, sir. It's not touching, but it's kind of, kind of back, and it's a little up. But it's, it's, it's not totally back, like on the ridges. Yeah. It's not that I see. So you, like her, have your tongue a little bit forward. I don't know what to say. You know, you young kids today. Um, there will be slight differences in how people pronounce these sounds. Um, and, you know, I, actually, I'll have some time to tell you about why that is, um, but not today. That I'm surprised by, though, I have to say. I've never met an African speaker who puts their tongue on the teeth. You're the first. Okay? Right? And now the rest of the consonants we'll learn, are they're kind of a grab bag of freaks. 
Uh, these are sounds in which two things don't come so close together that a frication is made, nor is a closure made, but instead, rather like vowels actually, the tongue is just positioned in a certain way to make a kind of shape in the oral tract. These are sometimes called semi-vowels or approximants or they're just, they're unique, each of these. Mm -hmm. And we'll have time to learn just a few of them today before we end. Okay. The first of these is created by taking the body of the tongue and raising it up towards the hard palate as if you were you know, as if you'd forgotten your dentures and had to mash peas. Okay? It's the sound that's found at the beginning of the word, yes, it's ya. Ya, 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 ya. Okay? It's non-nasal, it is voiced. We say it's palatal because the tongue is moving towards the hard palate, and the transcription symbol is a lowercase j, which is the symbol used to spell this sound in many European languages. Yeah. The next two are sounds that are produced by bringing the two lips together like you were making a kiss. One of these is voiced, the other voiceless. They're called bilabial approximants. They are the sounds wa, wa. That's this one. And hua. That's the upside down version. Okay. My mother, who is or was an English teacher, insisted that these words should be pronounced with this voiceless version. So, when are you coming home? <laughs> mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't think I use this. I don't think I have this sound in my, uh, my speech. Uh, you might not. Not everyone does. Wa and hua. Okay. And the last approximate we'll learn today is this one. It's the sound la. And here's how it's pronounced. It's exactly like da. The tip of the tongue comes up to the alveolar ridge and closes there, touches the alveolar ridge. The nasal passage is closed off. This is non-nasal. It is voiced. So it's just like da, except for da, the sides of the tongue are cupped up so that there's a complete closure along the hard palate. Whereas for la, the sides of the tongue are left down. Sides in, uh, sounds in which the side of the tongue are left unclosed are called laterals. So this is a lateral. It is the sound la. Again, if you say lol and suck, you'll feel the air coming in through the sides of your tongue. Okay. Wednesday, we continue. Again, bring clean hands.